computer. So do you have, um, did you find any typos or any mistake in the previous lecture? No. Um, I, I might have. Was there something up with the, um, when we did the example of um, deriving the Maxwell's equation from the electromagnetic tensor, was there something to do with the positive and negative signs there? Because I was going through it and, uh, or, or maybe I just uh, missed a negative sign when I was doing it. Uh, I mean, if if you if you find a, a typo like this, is is very likely. I mean, because uh, during the lecture, as you you may most of you you know, and you have taken in person lecture with me, I don't have notes. I don't carry notes with myself. So it's very likely that in driving equations, I will get minus sign or positive sign, or I will miss, uh, let's say, uh, a coefficient. Okay. So it, it is very likely in in a short, uh, but that was not. <laughs> no other. No. Okay. When uh, when I drive. Um, L L Lorentz gauge, I intentionally put a positive negative sign there when I drive the quarient form. So when you look at the uh, Lorentz gauge, um, um, there is a, a, the sign that you have it for divergence of A and derivative respect to uh, T of A should be the same. So they should be positive. And that was that was what I intentionally did it. Okay, doesn't matter. So uh, let's start. I I, uh, I don't remember that. I, I think we stop at uh, Dirac equation. All right. I hope that you had uh, a little bit of time to look into the Dirac equation and having a. Oh gosh, what's happening? Zoom, share screen. Okay, start broadcasting. Sorry, these technical things happen sometimes. Okay, so uh, we started uh, um, from Klein Gordon equation, and we say that the time, I, I mean, we started from the Schrodinger equation, and we say that. Schrodinger equation is a little bit uh, strange because time and position, they are not treated equally. So then we got the uh, Klein-Gordon equation and from the Klein-Gordon equation, which they were uh, both, they were, and they, it was second order derivative with respect to time and position. We got a first order equation, uh, which, uh, which we say that is, is a Dirac equation. Let me just write it down based on the previous lecture. I think uh, what we got, uh, we got this equation, and let me just check if the size is proper, uh, was i h bar derivative with respect to, maybe it's a little small. Let's go with bigger font. We got i h bar derivative uh, with respect to, uh, let's write it in this way. Gamma mu, derivative respect to mu, minus mc of psi equal to zero. So we got this equation, and then we say that let's use the uh, Feynman notation, which was a gamma mu, uh, derivative respect to mu, which we call it uh, um, d dash, d slash. And uh, then this equation, we wrote it as uh, I h bar the, the, the slash minus m c of psi equal to zero. Lovely. So we, we got this equation. And remember, what we obtained from this, it was just formal transition from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. What we have done, we replaced energy 
with an operator, which was uh, I, the uh, H bar derivative with respect to time. And also we replace, we replace momentum with h bar divided by i derivative uh, nabla. Okay, that was a formal replacement that we got to those equations. Uh, and remember that also uh, gamma zero was this gamma one was oh let's say call it gamma i. That one was, uh, I think was, uh, gamma zero was, uh, can you help me guys? It, I think it was um, uh, one and minus one, yes. It was one and minus one. And gamma i was sigma i and minus sigma i. Those parts, they were zero and sigma i they were Pauli matrices, which is sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. All right. So let's, uh, I, I, I think my job is done here, but let's talk about the physics. Let's talk about physics and just having a few example, what Dirac equation will give us that we don't get it from the Schrodinger equation. I think this is extremely important uh, before jumping to, to Maxwell equation and finding the similarity between Dirac equation and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Maxwell equation. So let's do the expansion of that term. So take that one and do a little bit of mathematics and let's do the expansion of them. So uh, we are, what I mean, we do I have, think, yes. I, I think we just had different values for uh, gamma i and gamma zero. Um, maybe if other people think I'm correct, I think we had gamma zero is uh, equal to uh, the the sigma z, and then it is easy gamma to one is equal to the identity. It is checking. I have the same thing written down. Yeah, I have that as well. Yeah. I have that too. Yeah, me too. Oh, Can okay. I was wondering about that, I and I checked on Wikipedia, and it's this formula you gave now that's the yeah, right one. Okay, okay. That, that makes more sense. The, the last lecture, it seems like it would be strange that the yeah, sigma okay. zero would be. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah, okay. I, I Maybe maybe in, in the equation that I had it there, that was the definition that we had it for the matrices, okay? But now this is, uh, look, this, uh, this is the previous lecture. Okay, this is a previous lecture. Uh, if you play with those matrices, definitely satisfy the condition that we had it here. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but the way that you have to place it there definitely should be the way that I am writing down right now. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Confirm. Good. Now, the, definitely uh, uh, the time derivative should have one and minus one. Okay, you will see it why, you know. <laughs> okay, let's write it down. So it will be um, uh, i h bar gamma zero derivative with respect to zero plus gamma one derivative with respect to one plus gamma two derivative with respect to two plus gamma three derivative with respect to three. All right. And then what we have on the top of this, which is minus MC, which you do have identity matrix in the dimension four. Okay, it's a four by four identity matrix times psi equal to zero. All right. So I let's do uh, a little bit of mathematics. Then we do have I H bar gamma zero is what we discuss is one, one, minus one, minus one. Okay. Then what we do have, we have derivative with respect to coordinate zero, which coordinate zero is CT. So it is derivative with respect to CT. Okay. Plus gamma one, 
gamma one is zero zero sigma x sigma x is one one return that one is with negative sign derivative with respect to x remember derivative with respect to uh one is derivative with respect to one superscript which which is identical to uh, derivative with respect to x okay if is subscript of one then that will be negative sign okay so it just remember so x mu was ct and x then derivative with respect to x which what, what we define it it is x mu is derivative with respect to ct and gradient all right well if you look at the uh, uh, the the conjugate form or let's say the uh, the dual form that will be derivative with respect to ct and minus gradient all right plus the other term what we have is sigma 2 which sigma 2 is a sigma y and it is minus i i zero zero of course this term all there zero 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 and that term will be plus i and minus i derivative respect to y and then what we have with respect to z then we have sigma z which sigma z is uh, one uh, minus one one minus one okay and finally we do have minus mc one yes, yes. Like the left code, third code is minus one, zero, zero, plus one. So, I look, look, yeah, look at this matrix, okay? Sigma Z is one minus one, okay? So, here, what you will have, you have Sigma Z, oh, okay. and Got the it. other one, you have a negative mm -hmm. sign. All right. Yeah. Good. Then uh, what we have here is identity matrix, which is uh, one, 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 and one, acting on wave function of psi. I think let's go with wide one. And different color equal to zero. And of course, no surprise that you expect the Psi uh, to have four components, okay? Which usually people, they call it chi A, chi A, let's say plus minus, chi B plus, oh, let's go with this way. So people, they call it chi, chi, and phi, phi. One of them, you can call them one, two, the other one, one, two. Okay, this is what we call it spinors. So far, so good? Sorry, I get a little bit of neck ache. Okay, I think now I feel much better. Uh, okay, fine. Let's put all together and write them the, the general matrix that we have for them. 
So let's write it down. So the general matrix, and I put all elements. So essentially, I should end up with a matrix which has four components. Okay. And let's write it down one by one. So the first one, it is, it is I H bar time derivative uh, 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 one divided by C derivative with respect to time. And then all elements, they are zero, except the last one, which is minus MC. So then what you will end up, you will get I H bar uh, divided by C time derivative minus MC. Okay. Do you agree? This is the scenario for all diagonal term, except the last two that you, uh, the derivative respect to T will show up with a negative sign. Okay? So that will be I H bar divided by C time derivative minus MC. Then the other one will be minus I H bar divided by C time derivative minus MC. And then the last one is minus i h bar divided by c time derivative minus mc. Good. Now we do have few other terms. So uh, uh, if you divide the matrix in, let's say, four different regions, this is what I have done with a with the uh, with the general matrix representation here, then I expect that this term should be zero, this term should be zero, this term should be zero, this term should be zero. Do you agree with me? Good. Now let's go and work on one three term. So I mean the term that should be placed here. So I'm looking at this one, which is zero, it's fine. This is zero as well. This is zero. That one has the value, which is, uh, which is one. Then you will end up with I H bar derivative respect to Z. Okay. In a similar fashion, I can prove that the other side also is minus I H bar derivative respect to Z. Okay. Similar way, again, I can, I can conclude that this term also is I H bar derivative with respect to Z and that term is minus I H bar derivative with respect to Z. So only the Z part has those terms, okay? Now we can work on uh, derivative with respect to X and derivative, derivative with respect to Y which they show up in anti-diagonal term in the, in the part two and part three. If you do a little bit of mathematics and you see here, I'm working on this term. So rest is zero. Of course, that one is I H bar, I H bar derivative with respect to X. The other term shows up with a minus I sign. So then uh, it will be, uh, I multiplied by minus I, it will be plus H bar derivative with respect to Y. Okay. Similar fashion, I get I H bar derivative with respect to Y minus H bar derivative with respect to Y. And then these terms are also... done a, an X for the first derivative there. Oh, yes, thank you. And then I get IH bar derivative with respect to X plus H bar derivative with respect to Y. Yes. Yeah, it's plus sign. Then I get plus sign, that is minus sign. Is it a minus for the X? Yes, yes, there is a minus in, in general on the top of this. So it will be minus sign here. 
Uh, oh, wait, wait. Let me do that again. So the first term will be I multiplied by these will be minus, uh, minus I H bar derivative with respect to X. Then the second term, I have a minus sign multiplied by it together. So it will be I multiplied by I will be minus. Then it will be minus H bar derivative with respect to Y. Agreed? And finally, the last term will be uh, mine, uh, again minus. Then that term will be plus. So it will be minus I H bar derivative with respect to X plus H bar derivative with respect to Y. And I think also the I H bar uh, derivative with respect to Z has to have a minus sign uh, for three one element and also three, the other one. Two, one, two, three, one. Here, you mean? Yeah. Do you mean here? Um, no, no, no. I mean... In the lower left-hand quadrants. Yeah, three, yeah, the... Three, one, that one has minus sign. Left down the Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's exactly. a and positive sign on, on the other one. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it, it is excellent to find typos, right? <laughs> Good. So, and then that should be multiplied by chi one, chi two, phi one, phi two, equal to zero. Okay, so that this is the Dirac equation for free particle. Remember, there is no potential here. All right. The first term. Look, look, look at look at how they treat they they can be treated. You can look at the chi one. You can look at the chi two. You can look at the phi one. You can look at the phi two. Right. So you can get ordinary differential equation for chi one. Uh, oh, let's be precise you will get partial differential equation for chi one, chi two, and phi one, phi two, from this equation. All right? Excellent. Now, I consider the most easy, easy scenario, that the particle has no momentum. Okay, when the particle has no, mem no momentum, which means that the derivative with respect to x, the derivative with respect to y, the derivative with respect to z is zero. Okay, I do not consider those cases. Then the only thing that I have, I'm looking for the energy of the particle. That might not be really the quantum mechanic picture, but I mean, this is the way that uh, you can get some physics out of these equations before going to really deep calculation. So for that cases, then what I will end up, I will get, uh, I will get this equation, which is I derivative uh, H bar divided by C time derivative uh, minus MC, zero, 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 zero. And then I H bar divided by C time derivative minus MC, zero, zero. Then I will get zero, zero, minus I H bar divided by C time derivative minus mc, zero, then I will get zero minus i h bar divided by c time derivative minus mc for chi one, k two, phi one, phi two equal to zero. All right, so what is the solution for chi one? I get i h bar divided by c ddt of chi one minus mc chi one is equal to zero, then chi one uh, dot is equal to mc square uh, minus i uh, divided uh, by h bar of chi one. Agree? 
In a similar fashion, I will get chi dot two, which is minus i m c squared divided by h bar chi two, and I get phi one dot, which is equal to i m c squared divided by h bar phi one and phi two dot is equal to i m c squared divided by h bar phi two. Okay, and from these, what I will get as a solution, is there any typos or any mistakes? No, okay. So then I will get chi one is given by exponential of i m c squared divided by h bar. Of course, there is a constant times t. And chi two, same scenario. m c squared divided by h bar t. Phi one is e power of i m c c squared divided by h bar t. And phi two, e power of i m c squared divided by h bar t. All right. What is, do you remember, m here is the rest mass of the particle that you want to solve the equation for, right? What is m c square? Rest energy. Rest energy, exactly. We assume that the particle is not moving, so that's, that's a scenario. So what we will get, we will get chi one is, equal, uh, is proportional, of course, there is a coefficient for normalization, whatever that you want to consider, given by e power of minus i energy divided by h bar t, the same scenario for chi two. But for phi one, what you will have, you will have e power of i in e, h, uh, e divided by h bar t and phi two is given by e power of i h bar t. Okay. Look, if you look at the time evolution, no, remember, look, look at the argument that you have it here for the exponential, okay? Is exponential of i a quantity times t? And this quantity will define energy, right? Energy divided by h bar. So essentially, apart from a fact of h bar, which many people uh, uh, in, in, in a standard mode, in, in a, in the GR, they take h bar c equal to one, so they they are not worried about this situation. So, uh, but what is important that essentially what you have, you have it e power of i times t. Usually, if the uh, what we, we if you look at the uh, energy operator, which is i h bar uh, uh, derivative respect to time. And if you look at that scenario, uh, you will see that usually that energy shows up with the negative sign, okay? In the exponential term, all right? So what, what I want to tell you, I want to tell you that look at the argument of phi and chi, they have different signs. All right, so one of them will tell us that is given by e power of minus i energy divided by h bar times t. The other one will tell us that e is given by e power of minus i minus energy divided by h bar times t. So this is for phi one and phi two, and that is for chi one and chi two. All right.
but we assume that energy is positive, then what is happening here? Now we are facing two different scenarios. One of them will tell us that is treated like a positive energy, and that one is treated like a negative energy. So essentially you have two particles, it seems, the Dirac equation inside of itself, it has two sort of particles. One of them has a positive energy, the other one has a negative energy. All right, any questions guys? So that was, that was essentially what Dirac called antiparticle. And remember this equation that I derived, it, it is for fermionic, so antiparticle for fermions, and this is for particle one. So if you assume uh, electron, then the first term, chi one and chi two, will give you uh, uh, electron wave function, and the other one will give you positron uh, wave function. So essentially, I mean, uh, you will see it in the, uh, in the treatment of field theory, that vacuum considered to be having infinite energy that we will see today as well. And at the time it creates particle and antiparticle and then they annihilate both. Okay, so you have sudden creation of particle and antiparticle and then they will annihilate. Anyway, that you can uh, allow them that one of those particle and antiparticle will be captured then the other one will be released, and then you can observe it. This is what happens in dynamic Casimir effect. So essentially what you do, uh, we will maybe later on, we will discuss about this scenario, but remember that Dirac equation in, in this fermionic picture that I showed to you will describe two different particles. One of them is, let's say particle, uh, fermionic particle, and the other one is, it's antiparticle, okay? And this is an important factor that you have to be aware of that and you have to uh, take care of it. Any question? No? no. Uh, this might be a dumb question, but you have uh, two, you have a chi one and a chi two. What exactly, what's the difference between the two of them? So, excellent question. Any other, any thoughts by, by you guys? I gave a hint already. Where we got those terms, by the way? I will reply to your question in a different picture. Let's go for it. Any, any, any of you have any thoughts on this? No one? Degenerate particles with the same energy. Uh, degenerate particles. Oh, how is it possible that you have a degenerate particle? Uh, are they particles with opposite spin? Like, are they with different spin? Are you uh, looking at numbers? Wikipedia, Josh? <laughs> no, no, I saw, no, no, no. Because <laughs> I'm just, I'm looking at, like, we have the uh, poly matrices that we're using. Exactly. Right? And, uh, yeah, you, okay. okay. You, you got that. You got that. Let's see it. Uh, by, the, by the way, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm making uh, jokes with you sometimes. Okay. Don't take it personal. Uh, we, cannot, we cannot stay for three hours <laughs> without having any jokes. Okay. Good. Excellent. Let me write, let me write Dirac equation in a different form, such a way that Josh questions will be manifested easily. Okay. Let's write down <laughs> Dirac equation in terms of Pauli matrices. What I have written at the beginning, do you remember that I wrote that uh, 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 gamma i, they are given by zero. I'm talking about this equation, right? <laughs> now I'm writing Dirac equation in terms of those, not expanding in terms of four by four matrices. So now I'm writing them in terms of two by two matrix. Let's see what we will get. So if, let us write Dirac equation 
in a two multiplied by two representations. Representation, which is essentially uh, is a representation of poly matrices. So let's do that. So uh, the first time again, it's not changed. It's it's a uh, i h bar uh, divided by c derivative with respect to time minus m c. And then also the other term, which is the, uh, the diagonal term will be negative sign, which will be minus i h bar divided by c derivative with respect to time minus m c. The other term, now I don't write them in terms of deriv derivatives. I will write them in terms of p. Do you remember that we, we define p as uh, 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 opposite way when we, when, when we did the, uh, the, let's say the transition from classical to quantum world, we say that is given by h bar divided by i uh, gradient. All right, let's do that and let's replace it here. What you will get, you will get minus sigma dot p and the other one you will get sigma dot p. Okay, and when I say sigma, I mean the three vector of sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. And when I wrote, uh, I write sigma dot p, I mean is sigma x, px, plus sigma y, py, plus sigma z, pz. Should it right. be sigma dot p in the top right hand corner and the minus should be in the bottom left hand corner? Uh, uh, let me let me see. I think I think it should be minus here. Um, uh, oh, okay, yes. I no, think, because uh, it's, it's h bar divided by i. Uh, yes, I can see. I when, can see I, when, the when, uh, when you bring the i hmm. to a nominator, then you will get a minus sign then. Okay, that's the reason. I think I think that's okay, makes sense. Yeah, and then I will write them makes as chi and phi equal to zero. All right. So I think I answered to your question, Josh. Right. So essentially, you have a chi one and chi two associated to spin up and spin down. If you want to see it in that picture, if you diagonalize it, essentially. Uh, and then uh, you have phi one and phi two, which is the spin for antiparticle. Good. As an exercise, try to solve this for a particle which is moving with the momentum along Z for yourself, okay? Assume that the, now, you, you, now you know that you have to treat particle and antiparticle being the same way. Now assume that the, your particle has only momentum along z direction, okay? And you will see that the antiparticle has momentum along negative direction of z. That comes back to the fact that Feynman had, uh, 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 had treated uh, this equation in a different perspective. He said that, okay, in the same time, what you can do uh, we know that negative energy can be, uh, can be associated to backward propagating particle, right? So it's, it's, uh, if, you look at, if you look at those two equations, what you will see that here, you have a negative sign. Uh, you do have a negative sign here and positive sign here. So what he did, he said that no, I bring these negative sign inside of the time. So now I say that this antiparticle is propagating backward in the time. Okay, it's representing the past, which I mean, those people that they work with the wave optics, they know that when usually when we have four solutions for Maxwell equations, one of them is going with exponential of i k z minus omega t, the other one is going by e power of uh, minus, uh, oh, let's say kz plus omega t. And then we say that omega t is backward propagating waves and minus omega t is forward propagating waves. Here, exactly the same scenario. This is what Feynman 
assigned to five. Clear? Excellent. Now let's go, and I think I think we understood clearly uh, at least what's going on uh, with a relativistic picture to watch waves. And we looked uh, into a Schrodinger equation and then Klein-Gordon equation, and finally Dirac equation. So uh, we obtained the Dirac equation by looking at uh, energy quadrant form, or let's say four momenta quadrant form, which is P mu, uh, P mu. And from these, just by formal replacement with operator, we got these equations. And we understand what, uh, what is the meaning of each term. And uh, also we previously, we looked at the electrodynamics formalism and we understand that also uh, uh, electric and magnetic field that can be treated equally again. And we did have uh, uh, electromagnetic tensor, F mu nu. And from those, we got the Maxwell equation. And we had no worries that they satisfy relativity without having any problems. So all of those things that we showed here, they satisfy relativity. Now on, we have the building block to look at the quantization. And we can look at only photon picture, only photonic system. So now I will go back to Maxwell equations. But I mean, I, at the beginning, I say to you guys that, I mean, in previous lecture, that we have to be a little bit careful with photon because photon doesn't have a rest mass, right? We, we saw that from a Klein-Gordon equation. Klein-Gordon equation was look like a wave equation for us. Just for the case of photonic system, you have to replace uh, photon, you have to replace M0 with zero. Then you will get the famous uh, scalar wave equation. Now, uh, people, they raise a lot of questions about photons and they say, okay, uh, do we really have the permission to talk about wave function for photon? All right, because it's not coming out of Schrodinger equation, it's not coming out of Dirac equation. So then are, are we having the permission because also photon doesn't have a rest mass. Do we have a permission to talk about wave function for photon? So that's the question, photons wave function. Uh, honestly speaking, people, they have different perspectives. Some people, they say, yes, we do have a permission to talk about wave function of photons. Some people, they say, no. There is no coherent agreement among people. However, uh, in, there is a representation which what it does, it shows that you can see photons in some sort of Dirac equation, okay? And then you can just say, okay, fine. I, I came to an agreement that there is a similarity between the two and then I stopped doing uh, the argument. Let's start with Maxwell equation and it, we draw the quarian form. It was an exercise for you to expand them. I think we expand last time for one or two cases. So uh, I will go directly with the Maxwell equation for, uh, let's say for vacuum, without charge, without current, easy, so easy. So it is in vacuum. So I have curve of E, which is given by minus time derivative of B. And then I have a curl of magnetic field, which is given by one divided by C squared time uh, derivative of E. And then I have divisions of E, which is equal to zero. And I have a curl a divisions of B, which is equal to zero. All right, so E is vacuum, uh, no charge. No, let's say. Rho is zero and J also is zero. Okay. Of course, I know that mu zero, epsilon zero 
is one divided by c square uh, c square. All right. Good. What is the relation between uh, electric field and magnetic field for plane wave? What is the magnitude ratio between these two? I think you have seen that in uh, EM. Both of them, they carry the same energy, all right? I think we know very well that electric field and magnetic field, uh, they carry the same energy. Uh, uh, also, there is another question that we know that they form a right angle, E, B, and K, if you assume them. Then uh, also there is a relation between electric field and magnetic field in terms of magnitude. Electric field is C times magnetic field, okay? So considering this, then I define a new vector. Huh. Now I'm treating magnetic field as an imaginary part of a vector. This vector is called Riemann Silver. Stein vector or field. Okay, so remember in this representation, a real part of F is electric field, and imaginary part of F is CB. There are different ways, by the way, people, they, 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 they design these. So uh, another formalism, if I remember by heart, um, uh, let me look at the energy. Energy is given by square root of E. Okay, it's given by, there is another formalism is epsilon zero E. Uh, and the other one is plus I B divided by Mu zero. This is another way. So if you take away the square root of epsilon naught, then you will get E plus I B divided by square root of mu zero epsilon zero. And then you will get epsilon zero E plus I B times C, of course. Good. Can anyone tell me how did I wrote this equation, this one? I want to teach you to remember this and not forgetting. Did you use the uh, one over C squared and basically just factor it and move things around <laughs> since there's a C in the B term of that equation? Uh, no, David. <laughs> uh, I will give you a hint. Make a square of each of these two terms. Look at the power uh, power of two of those terms. What are they? Isn't that the energy? Exactly, exactly. Those two are the energy term for E and B field. So one of them is electric field energy. The other one is magnetic field energy. But I know that the dimensionality is the same. So if you take a square root of these two, also they are the same dimensionality. This is the way that I look at them. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Flo. Good. So now I'm dealing with a complex vector 
which is E plus ICB. Now, let's drive. Let us find equations for F. Can you find equations for F? The divergence that has to be zero? Absolutely. The clear one is the divergence of F is zero. Why? Because the divergence of F is the divergence of uh, E plus I C B and that is divergence of E plus I C divergence of B, which both of them they are zero for vacuum without the charge. Okay. The other one. What else you should look for, Eric? The curl of yeah. uh, the curl of F. Yeah. So uh, let me ask someone else just to see who is there. Uh, God, uh, let me see. Okay. Uh huh. I'm sure that you are all there. Uh huh. Uh, Valerio. Yeah. Come, come stay. Bene, grazie. Okay. Benissimo. So uh, let's ask a question to Valerio. So why we care about divisions and curl? Do you have any thought? Uh, yes. So, uh, derivative respect to time of B. Yeah. Uh, 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 let me let me rephrase my question. Why always we care about finding divisions of a vector and and the curl of that vector. It's based on the boundary condition, right? So if you know the boundary condition, and if you know that uh, the system, uh, and you know these two vectors, you can divide two, let's say, elements, then you can define a vector uniquely. One of them will give you the transverse component, the other one will give you the normal component, right? Yeah. Excellent. So let's do that together, Valerio. So let's look at the curl of F. So curl of the, the, the. Why I'm asking you guys? Because I want to be sure that I'm not doing any mistakes. <laughs> so curl of F is curl of uh, E plus ICB. Then that is curl of E plus I. C curl of B. All right. So, uh, what is curl of E? So T of B. Yes, is minus derivative of T. Uh, oh, sorry. B. Uh, yes, T uh, B with respect to time. And what is the other one? Uh, one by C squared derivative of E. Derivative of E. Excellent. So then uh, what I have, I have derivative with respect to T of B with a negative sign plus I divided by C of E. And that is essentially, I can factor out and I, so minus sign here, can be written as I multiplied by I. Then I can factor out a C, or one divided by C. Then I will get uh, I divided by C time derivative of I 
CB plus E. Good. Which this is essentially I divided by C time derivative of F. All right. Any questions? Oh, two questions to, oh God, I, I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, hey, uh, Okay, my apologies guys. All right, so then we got the second equation. The second equation is this. So let's write it down. Is the first one is divergence of F is zero. The second one is curl of F is equal to I divided by C time derivative of F. And remember, F is Riemann Silverstein uh, vector, which is E plus I C B. All right, good. So those are Maxwell equations for, uh, uh, we derive that from Maxwell equation. Let's simplify these equations a little bit more. My apologies, guys, is just algebra, but uh, but they are insightful, uh, let's say, thoughts and also physics, beautiful physics behind of these. And it, it answers to some of your questions that you may have, and you may had it in the past. So from these, the, the first, equ first equation is a condition. Right, which tells you that the divisions of f must be equal to zero. So it finds a relation between fx, fy, and fz, and I mean derivatives that should be equal to zero. So is a condition that should be satisfied by f. Look at the second term. The second term, it seems that it has some time evolution. First thing that you should realize, the time is a first order and position also is a first order derivatives, which is excellent. That, that tells us, since we know that, that they are coming from Huxley equation, so they satisfy a, a, a relativistic transformation. So we have no worry about that. But look at the physics that you it's hidden here. So in order to do and understand better, let's do the expansions. So the first one will be I divided by C time derivative of F minus curl of F equal to zero. Huh, who can make a guess what I'm going to do? Take the divergence. Uh, what? Uh, take the divergence of uh, the curl equation. And no. Okay. And this form that I'm writing here is similar to something, but I want to prove that. Expand it and compare it with Dirac equation. Exactly. Exactly. Beautiful. So let's do that. So in order to do so, I mean, of course, they, they, for those people that they know advanced calculus, uh, I, they know very well how to treat this, but let's do that in a, in a basic way. So this is I divided by C time derivative. Oh, I have something beautiful already here. So is I derivative with respect to zero, right? One, uh, one divided by C derivative with respect to time is the derivative with respect to zero of F minus curl of F. Curl of F has 
three components. What are those three components? So uh, is x hat derivative with respect to two f three f three minus three f two minus y hat derivative with respect to three f one minus derivative with respect to one f three minus z hat derivative with respect to uh, pa, 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 one f two minus derivative with respect to two f one equal to zero. For x component, y component, and z component of fx and fy, so and fz. So if you write it down, this is essentially three equations. So the first equation is for uh, x, which is i derivative with respect to zero, minus uh, fx minus uh, second order of f3, f1 plus derivative of f2 equal to zero. And then the same scenario, mm, or let's do it in this way. with negative sign, uh, I derivative of F1. Then the last term will be plus, uh, plus derivative of one F3 equal to zero. The last one will be plus second derivative of F1 plus, um, minus first derivative of F2. And finally, plus I first derivative, zero derivative of F3 equal to zero. Okay. So these are the equations that we do have. And now let's write them down in terms of uh, matrix formalism. So if I want to write them, write them down, oh, it's just maybe it's better to switch these two. Mm -hmm. The first two I'm switching them, it will be plus derivative of f3 minus 2 f3. I think there is no mistake. Then let's write it down. It can be written as i0 derivative. Uh, that's the uh, derivative with respect to 3. That's minus derivative with respect to 2. That's minus derivative with respect to three, i derivative with respect to zero, derivative with respect to one, uh, derivative with respect to two, minus derivative with respect to one, and i derivative with respect to zero of f1, f2, f3 equal to zero. In the first equation, it's um, the second one is derivative uh, with respect to three F2. Oh, yes, F2. thank you. Thank you very much. That should be F2. Yeah. Okay. Now let's expand it. 
The expansion will be, as we discussed previously, it will be I, uh, oh, let's write it down here. I think uh, you can check it, you can check this out at home uh, to see if whether those coefficients they are uh, proper. If they are not proper, we will figure it out in a few minutes. Um, let's do that. It will be I, identity matrix, derivative with respect to zero. Then you, we go with derivative with respect to one, which derivative with respect to one uh, will be, yeah, derivative with respect to two will be here. And derivative with respect to three will be here. So now yeah, I have to find out and fill out this puzzle. So derivative with respect to one will have this term. So it will be one minus one, the rest will be zero. Can you confirm? Yep. Derivative with respect to two will be minus one and plus one here, and the rest will be zero. Yes. Derivative with respect to z three will be one minus one zero 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 zero. And of course, this is a matrix acting on F1, F2, F3 equal to zero. All right. Beautiful. Let's take away an I from each of these matrices. I want to write in terms of Dirac formalism, okay? So what I have to do, I have to take away an I here. So what I do, I will multiply by I minus I, which is one. Here, the same story, I minus I, I minus I. I will take away the I out, so I will get I, one, 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 derivative with respect to zero, plus I, zero, 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 minus I, plus I, zero, 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 derivative with respect to one, plus I, I, minus I, Derivative with respect to two plus i zero minus i i zero 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 derivative with respect to three. F one, F two, and F three equal to zero. Good. I call this alpha zero. I call this alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. So essentially at the end, what I have, I have I alpha I, oh, let's see. Alpha mu, derivative of mu of f equal to zero. Remember here f has three.
components. And essentially, each of those three components, they have a real part and an imaginary part. All right. Is this equation similar to in familiar to you? Who knows this equation? Felix? He's not there. Chandler? So have you seen Chandler? Have you seen this equation previously? Oh, yeah. Okay. Where? Let me ask someone else. Uh, yes. Okay, so Henry. It might be similar to something we saw last week, but I'm trying to find it. So if you look at just uh, a few, let's say line up, we got this equation. <laughs> We got this equation, right? The first equation that we have written here. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So let me uh, write it down here. So if you look at Dirac equation, Dirac equation was I H bar, right? Gamma mu derivative respect to mu of minus MC of psi equal to zero. This is similar in some, somehow similar to, to, to Dirac equation with only two differences. What are they? Kate? Um, in this case, we don't have the MC term. Uh, so I think it's, yes, yeah, said in the chat, uh, mass is zero. And? And, um, oh, this H bar term, we don't have but I mean, yeah, yeah. Is that is that not something that could potentially come into the alpha? Yeah, uh, it, it can go out, okay? But remember, whenever you have H bar, is a sign that you are in the quantum regime. I see, okay. okay. So we, we don't have it. Essentially, we don't have it in the calculation. So if you start with the Riemann silver sign, essentially, you don't get H bar in that okay. equation. Okay, so those are the two points, but the rest is similar. There is something which, which is different between the two equations. Let me ask someone else. Arman, can you help me to figure that out? Um, is it the fact that uh, F has three components? And Lovely, exactly. Yeah, so the matrix is that we have it here is three-dimensional, right? It's a three, three by three. Here, the, they were two by two, okay? Assuming that we don't care about at the particle. Then there is something different. Oh gosh, so if you remember, we discussed about that. I mean, that was Eric's question, uh, sorry, Josh, uh, Josh question that he say, uh, hey, Ibrahim, can you tell us what is chi and phi? And we discussed that and we came to a conclusion that they are related to spin and here, we have three components. What does it mean? Let's ask Josh again. Since you raised that question, let me ask you. I regret everything. Um, it's the uh, three polarization components, right? So that would correspond to, oh God, it's been a while since take quantum. So I think it's the, uh, the spin of a, uh, of a boson, right? So like there's uh, three spin components. Very good, very okay. good. You are getting there. 
Exactly. This is look like a particle with spin of one. Okay. A particle which has a spin of one, what do we have as a permission? Minus one, zero, zero and one. And one. Excellent. So we do have that. So photon is, or let's say electric and magnetic field, if you write it in this perspective, and then later on you will see that these really look like photon. Uh, it, it's, it's a photonic treatment. You can, you can, we can watch it as a photon uh, uh, wave function, wave function in this way, and uh, that is behaving like a spin of one particle. Okay, so you can have a spin of zero, you can have a spin of one, you can have a spin of minus one. All right, this is what I see from that equation. Is that con is this conclusion true? Or oh, there is something that I'm missing? Let me ask Nazanin. What do you think, Nazanin? Is uh, this statement by Josh and me, is it correct? Or the, I, there is something that I'm missing? A photon has a spin equals to one. That's true, but um, I I don't get uh, how it is related to e x, e y, e z, and you know. Look, we have f, which has three components, mm -hmm. right? And here yeah. we have three matrices, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. Okay, so those are the relation that you can have it between them. Valerio, yeah. am I missing something here? Oh, this treatment is correct. No thoughts? No, no. No? What about the antiparticle component you have in the back? That's an excellent question as well. We will discuss about that. So let's let's first solve the problem. We say that this is look like a spin of one particle, which means that we do have spin of plus one, zero, and minus one. Is this statement correct? Or I am missing something here. No one. So, uh, are, you, are it, you missing the spin down case? What? Are you missing the spin down case? If you have two spins? No, I, I don't have a two spin. I have three spins oh. now. Is, is, is it look like a, a spin one particle? What uh, Josh says that it look like a boson, okay? Is not look like a spin one half, which is a fermion. But there is something here which I'm missing. Anyone that can find out, you, they will get one mark. What I'm missing. Now, I, is, there missing is a motivation the on the table. What? Who is speaking? Are you missing that the divergence of f has to be zero? Absolutely. So, Kyle, you will get one mark, okay? Email me after this. Look, what I started with was curl of f equal to, I don't remember even, so curl of f is equal to i divided by c time derivative of f. I did not use the other equation, which is the divisions of f is equal to zero. If you use the divisions of f equal to zero, then spin zero will be gone. There is no spin zero permitted here. Okay, that comes from the transversality. So when you have the divisions of f is equal to zero, then that tells you that your field is transverse then not all spins will be allowed. Only two of them will be allowed. 
And who knows about the contractions? No, no one? Okay. We, we will discuss about that. I, I don't want to go to high energy physics and, and discussing about the group theory. But this is an important conclusion. Only looking at Dirac-like equation, this is look like a boson with a spin of one. However, when you look at the divergence of f equal to zero, that poses a condition that zero spin is not allowed. So essentially, photon or electromagnetic field behaves like a spin one particle excluding spin zero. It has only two, two values, plus one and minus one. Good? All right. There is a quantity which we love it and we call this helicity. And this helicity is something which people, they use it a lot. So uh, uh, let's, let's look at that equation that I have written here. So uh, now I don't talk about, you can define helicity for any particle. For rel relativistic one, fermionic or bosonic is up to you. Uh, the definition that you have it for helicity is given, uh, I mean, you define it in this way, helicity is given by uh, a spin along propagation direction. Oh, let's be precise, not writing only for uh, spin along uh, uh, P, along propagation direction. And then you have to really normalize it. You have to normalize it based on S and P. So this is what we call it, helicity. Spin along the propagation direction. Or if you want to talk about particle, spin along momentum. So for example, if you want to, if you assume that your particle is moving along Z, then you can look at uh, the product of spin dot PZ, okay? So this is what you will get is SZ, PZ, divided by the value of S and P. Okay. Any questions so far is okay. Oops. So for photon, this helicity, since the, type, the divisions of F poses the condition, this helicity will take only two values, plus H bar and minus H bar along propagation direction. All right. As an exercise, do it for yourself. Don't forget the, the Dirac-like equation that we drive for, uh, for F vector. Prove it that a long propagation direction, if you assume that it is EZ, it's a, is, is a KZ, then photon will have only these two values for the helicity, okay? And for electron, of course, this is minus uh, h bar divided by two and plus h bar divided by two. 
for a, for a, a, a bosonic a boson with a spin of one that will be plus h bar minus h bar and zero. Okay. That tells you what is the magnitude along propagation direction. Naively speaking, spin or helicity that we have it here is look like polarization of the light. If you have left-handed polarization, that will give you helicity of plus one. And if you have right-handed, that will give you helicity of minus one. I say to you that you have to be very careful with this wording. At this level, I will not take it deeper than this. So just, just uh, watch it in, in a naive way that, uh, yes, circular position left and right, they will give you a helicity of plus one and minus one. There is something more on this. So uh, helicity, is it a scalar or, or vector quantity? Scalar is the pro is it the product. Is it, is it exactly a scalar quantity? When is the scalar quantity? And this is a true scalar, is not pseudo scalar, by the way. When is a scalar quantity? It should not change upon changing the frame. So if a beam or particle has a helicity of plus one or minus one, Eric, Victor myself, Valerio, Kate, all of us, we see that specific elicity again. It's, it does not depend on our coordinate. So a scalar quantity will not change upon transformation because the propagation direction, of course it changes, but accordingly also S will change. Then the dot product always is constant. Okay, this is an important factor. When people, they talk about polarization of light, C core position left, C core position right, C core position left and right, if you change your head, it will change. But helicity is constant. Okay. Good, excellent. So uh, with this, uh, I will conclude this part and then I will go with the next section uh, uh, which 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 is which is doing the quantization I think all of us we know know very well what is the relativistic regime that we are dealing with how to do the transformation we know what what you do as a first quantization okay quantization of energy and and uh, and momentum and uh, angular momentum and etc. You you already know all of these from classical mechanics. We talk about uh, Dirac equation, so we understood that you can deal with with something which is relativistically invariant, and you can still solve, let's say, a, a quantum mechanics. You can you can look at the quantum mechanical picture of uh, matters. And then we look at the uh, uh, electrodynamics picture and we drive similar equation for uh, photon. And we understood that photon, due to the condition that we have it as a divisions of F should be equal to zero, then it should be transverse. So it means that only the spin will take two values. Now what we will do, uh, we will jump and we will do the quantization of the field. Okay. Do you have any questions so far or, or all is okay? So um, we, we started with, again with Maxwell equation. I don't want to write them down, but also we choose the gauge. And from the gauge, we realize that electric field is given by minus gradient of phi minus time derivative of A. All right, guys. Assuming that now, I mean, here often I, I will have some assumptions, I will tell you. And B was given by curl of A. No question so far. And what we found for, uh, for A and phi was wave equation for both of them. 
So for both of them, we got something like that, the average in a Laplacian minus one divided by C square time derivative of A equal to zero. And we say for, for phi depends on the gauge, depending on the gauge, we will get something else. As guys, just remember that we have J equal to zero, rho equal to zero. We are working in vacuum, so not with matter. If we go in, in matter, the situation will be a little bit different. Okay, someone asked a question. Oh, it was a long time ago. Okay. Good. And we had gauges for, for, uh, for A and phi. We say that we have four gauges. And I mean, two of them, they are very famous, Lorentz gauge and, and the column gauge. Uh, if you look at the Lorentz gauge, we had divisions of A plus one divided by C, I think, time derivative of phi equal to zero. And that was Lorentz gauge. And the other gauge was divergence of A equal to zero. Lorentz gauge was, was uh, we could obtain it from the quarian form of, uh, of four potential. And I think that that's what we discussed last time. However, for simplicity, we deal, we work with column gauge, which means that we take divisions of A is equal to zero and also phi equal to zero. For which case, I'm telling you again, j is equal to zero and rho equal to zero. Only for this case, I'm choosing this gauge. But in this case, then this is equivalent to the Lorentz gauge because it's an, the phi term is also zero. Uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily phi term is zero. Look, column gauge is higher than the gauge mm -hmm. that I'm choosing right now. Here, I'm choosing phi equal to zero as well. Mm -hmm. In the low, but then if phi is zero, mm -hmm. if you if you if you take phi to be zero, if you force it in um, with the choice of gauge, then the equation that defines the Lorentz gauge will be will be the same as the equivalent uh, the equation. That defines the Coulomb gauge for uh, in terms of a. Yeah, of course, of course. Okay, right. But no, th there is a hint here. I'm telling you. Go home and try. If I choose this the, gauge, the going home part will be easy. Yeah. So, phi equal to zero. If I choose phi equal to zero, mm -hmm. then I should have this condition that rho is equal to zero else this is not valid. Remember, it's a different scenario mm -hmm. from column gauge. Okay. Column gauge will tell you that Laplacian of phi is equal to minus rho divided by epsilon naught. Okay? Mm -hmm. Here, okay. what oh, okay. I'm doing, mm -hmm. I'm telling you that when there is no charge and no current, then you can choose phi to be equal to zero. Okay, makes sense, thank you. Okay, of course. So now I'm dealing with a, uh, uh, A. And what I will get for A is a wave equation. How do you solve a wave equation? How do you solve this?
Now, before doing so, if I solve this wave equation for A, how can I find electric field and magnetic field? Do you agree? Easily, I can get it just only looking at uh, uh, at uh, uh, time derivative of a and curl of a. Excellent. Good. So now, tell me, how do I solve these a? How can I find a? Separation of variables. Yes, of course. But before that, what I need? Trial solution. What? Trial solution, you guess it? Ah, uh, uh, no. No, uh, boundary conditions. What, Ben? Uh, uh, boundary conditions. Uh, excellent point, Ben. Excellent. First, you have to tell me the problem. I have a wave equation. But you have to tell me for which physics should I solve it, OK? So assuming that I have a system, and when I want to solve, uh, let's say, and finding electric field and magnetic field for this system, I have to know the boundary condition. And from uh, boundary condition, I can solve the equation. But of course, Josh, you are right. The, the easy way is using separation of variables. Do you agree? And yes. Just, excellent. Just separation of variables in the Cartesian coordinate essentially is given by Fourier transform. So what we do, we usually, we look at the e power of i, kxx, kyy, kzz, and minus i omega t. This is what we do essentially. And then we change k and then we find a relation between kx, ky, kz, and omega. And then we do the full integration here. But I, I, I'm sure that you have seen this in many different, let's say, scenarios. Uh, in the course of uh, electromagnetism, also in the electrodynamics, I solved this for you guys in several different coordinates in Cartesian coordinates, in cylindrical coordinates and in spherical coordinates in terms of YLM and, and Bessel functions and et cetera. I, I don't want to really go into this scenario. So uh, uh, what, uh, let, let, me, let me tell you uh, something that you have to be very careful. When we talk about boundary condition, you should understand, are we talking about electric field and magnetic field? Are we talking about normal of them? or we are talking about, let's say, tangent of them. So you have to be very careful with handling electric field and magnetic field. I think we also discussed that in the course of electrodynamics that you have Dirichlet boundary condition, a Neumann boundary condition, or the mixed one. So I don't want to introduce to these sort of problems. You have already solved, the, have seen those, uh, let's say, uh, uh, boundary condition problems. I mean, these, you understand very well what I'm talking about because we had these in the course of electrodynamics and you know it's extremely rich subject by itself, but it has application here. Uh, now let's, let's look at the, uh, again, uh, vector potential and, and solving it for specific geometry. Okay, let me define my geometry. This is the geometry that I'm giving you and I want you and I expect you to solve this geometry. I have a box here. Okay, this is my box in here. So for example, this box is uh, is a cube hole inside of a conductor, conducting material. All right. So the rest is, 
for example, iron. Which the electric field inside of iron will be What is the electric? Okay. What? Zero. Zero. Okay. This is just, I want to tell you what is the formalism behind. We also call these a, 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 a block body. Okay. Um, so this is X, this is Y, this is Z, and I have a length of L, length of L, length of L here. What I want to do, I want to find electric field and magnetic field inside this. Now we, we moved from abstract mathematics, understanding the physics behind the particles and also of, uh, let's say photon and now what we do, we want to understand uh, uh, the problem for a specific geometry and solving it and finding the result for it. Okay, clear? Good, how do you solve this guys? First of all, I have to understand the boundary condition. All right, A, remember, is a vector. Look, I, I want to tell you about the intuition. If A is a vector, then electric field also is a vector, which is connected to each other by just a time derivative with a negative sign. What do you expect for electric field to have? How many vectors you should have? Independent vector. We just discussed that. Mahtab? Can you please repeat your question? So I, I say that A is linked to uh, E, electric field. So if I have A, I can take a derivative and I get minus TA. So essentially, yes. E also is a vector. So do you remember that for electric field, we say we have specific condition. What was the specific condition for electric field? Cannot be any vector. It can be only transverse vector, right? Yes. Okay, so it means that it has only two degrees of freedom, the degree of freedom, right? It has only two yes. vectors. Good. So remember, A is a vector, but the vector that is in a plane all right, good. Thank you. Excellent. So I know that A is a vector. What, uh, and what is the condition on A? A here at that surface and here at that surface, they should be identical. Who doesn't agree? A's on the boundary, they should be identical because they will give the same electric field and same magnetic field, which is zero essentially. Do you agree? Who doesn't agree? If I take this cube, okay? If I rotate it, it's the same. So I'm not expecting that the boundary condition here will be different from this boundary condition here. Because that's inside of a metal and electric field and magnetic field inside of the metal is zero. So a vector here at x equal to zero, y any y, any z, any time should be electric field, sorry, any, uh, the same potential at L and Z, Y and Z and T, the same scenario for uh, X, zero, Z and T.
and the same scenario for z, which is z t x y and l and t equal. Okay, do you agree? Excellent. This is the condition that I have. From the separation of variable, which we discuss here, right? I'm just highlighting it here. In the Cartesian coordinate, I'm expecting that I have exponential of i, kxx, kyy, kzz, right? So for a potential, essentially I'm expecting, I'm not talking about the vector. Vector, forget that because we, we already discussed that it has two different, uh, let's say it, it has two vectors and it should be in a plane, but I'm looking at the phase, which is functionality, is kxx plus kyy plus kzz. So what I expect from this, that A, at zero should be equal to A at X equal to L. These two, they should be identical from the first equation. So what does it mean that E power of I, K X L should be equal to E power of I zero, which is one, which is E power of I two pi N one. Do you agree? Good or not? Who has problem? So I'm what I'm doing, I'm for the first condition, I'm replacing x to be zero and x to be equal to L. And I get this equation. So from the first equation, I will get kxl equal to 2 pi n1. And from here, I will get kx equal to 2 pi divided by l n1. What do you tell me? that along x, k vector is quantized, right? K vector is quantized. And the quantization is given by two pi divided by L. And the same way, e power of i, k, y, L is equal to e power of i, 2 pi n2, which is a different number, of course. And then I will get ky 2 pi divided by L n2. And similar fashion kz, 2 pi divided by L n3. All right, good. So for an, a potential, which I assume that is proportional to I power of K dot R, which I talk about all of these, minus I omega T, remember K, is kx, ky, and kz, then this k is quantized and given by 2 pi divided by L, n1, n2, and n3.
Okay. Substituting it into wave equation. Which, what is wave equation that we had? It was Laplace minus one divided by C squared time derivative of A equal to zero. If you substitute it inside of this derivative with respect to X, derivative with respect to X of A is derivative with respect to X of any scalar, let's call it, I, I don't, sorry, any vector, constant vector of, let's say, circle, e power of i k dot r minus i omega t, that will be given by uh, derivative of x of e power of i k x x plus k y y plus k z z minus i omega t, then that will be equal to i k x, the same function. Okay. So second derivative of x, that will be give uh, that can be replaced by minus k x squared. Second derivative of uh, uh, with respect to y can be replaced by minus k y squared. Second derivative uh, of z will be replaced by minus z square. And also derivative with respect to time can be replaced by uh, minus i omega. So second derivative of time will be replaced by minus omega square. So if you replace uh, uh, all of these equations inside, then what you will get, you will get kx power of two plus ky power of two plus kz power of two. Uh, that will be all with negative sign plus a uh, yes, omega squared divided by c squared equal to zero. Then what we will get, we will get two pi divided by L power of two, n one power of two plus n two power of two plus n three power of two equal to omega squared divided by c squared, which this is k squared. Okay, so this quantization of the uh, of uh, uh, k vector that you will see it appears as n1, n2, and n3, and those n1, n2, and n3 they can be any integer quantities. Ibrahim. Yes. Shouldn't it two pi over l be third power? Should be where? Uh, the last the last equation you have two pi over l squared. Uh huh. We're in three three D, so it shouldn't they be cubed? Uh, mm -hmm. K X is replaced by two pi divided by L. N N one, right? Yeah. And the same. Oh, never mind. Is okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Excellent. Are we good? Okay. So A, no, uh, I, I found the functionality on x, y, and z, and, t, and time, which this functionality is given by exponential of e. Uh, let's write it in this way. e power of i k dot r minus omega t. This is what I used. And I found the relation for k which k square is given by two pi divided by L power of two of n1, n2, n3. 
and also if you want to link it to omega, omega is given by Kc, which is the dispersion relation. We will discuss about that later on. And we say that let's go back to uh, A uh, in terms of uh, vectorial nature. So we assign a vector to E, to A. I call this vector vector of E. And this vector is assigned for any K direction. So not necessary that all of the waves inside of this cavity that I have all of waves, they are propagating like this direction or that direction or that direction. They can go in any arbitrary direction. Okay. So for any arbitrary direction of K, then I have a specific, let's say, uh, uh, transverse component for uh, A. Let's call this E of K. All right. And then I will put a coefficient here, which later on you will see, I will call it N, or you can call it calligraphic A. Which also depends on the K. This is vector potential. For a given mode. Which the mode is right now I call it K mode, but later on we will discuss about that. Let's just keep it for the time being in this uh, simple form. Is it clear guys? Inside of this, let's say, cavity that we have, we have different modes going in different direction. I know what's going on with those modes and I expand them in terms of plane waves. All right. But now I have to talk about the amplitude of it and also the vector, the polarization degrees of freedom for that. This is what I'm writing. But remember what I wrote as a potential is only for, for for one of the k, vect uh, k vectors, one of those modes, which satisfy this condition here. Okay. If you if you change k, right? I can choose one specific k. They say k one equal to uh, a quantity, k naught. Then I have a certain modes there associated to this. If I change k naught to two k naught, then I'm dealing with a different mode. Okay. So what I'm writing here is just, excuse me, for a given mode of k. All right. Now we have to find out what is going on with the vector of e k. Which gauge are we working on? Mm -hmm. Column gauge, which means that the divergence of A is equal to zero. So look at the divergence of AK, which is the divergence of AK, EK, Exponential of i k dot r minus omega t. A k is constant, right? It can be out. And for those people that they, they I mean, they have taken the course of electrodynamics with me, they know very well that for plane waves, I know that gradient can be replaced by i k. I prove this. You can you can do that as well by yourself. Then what we will end up, we will end up to have this quantity, which is I A K K dot E K.
Agreed? That should be equal to zero. This is not zero and cannot be zero. AK is the amplitude and is not zero. So what else we have is K dot EK should be equal to zero. K dot EK should be equal to zero. So assuming inside of that cavity, this is K vector, a given K vector, that you have it for specific mode, Now, this equation will tell us that E k has a condition. The vector that you choose, the vector that you choose for expanding this vector has a condition. What is the condition? Should be orthogonal to the k. So, this is the plane that EK is located. And by the way, this EK is unit vector, okay? It's, it doesn't have a, a, for simplicity, I say that the, 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 the dimensionality is one, okay? So everything is hidden inside of AK calligraphic. All right? So EK should be in that plane. How many different vectors do I have for EK now? Two dimensions. Two dimensions. I will call this one E K one. And that one, which is orthogonal to this also, I call it E K two. This is what we call it polarization. And you will see it when it comes to electric field. Clear? So for any mode, we have two different polarizations. One of them is EK1, the other one is EK2. That's the reason that we label them with E, K vector, and number of sigma. And sigma can take two values of one and two, or people, they call it also minus one and plus one. They can go with left-handed, right-handed, okay? Or they can go with H and V, which is what we call it one and two. But remember, this is for any mode. Good, what is the property of EK one and EK2. Look at this. What is the property of these two? It'll be orthogonal. Exactly. They are independent. They are orthogonal to each other. So you remember, you should remember that E, K, and sigma dot E, K prime and sigma prime should be given by delta of k, k prime, delta of sigma, sigma prime. And if they are in the same mode, they are orthogonal to each other. If they are independent mode, also they are independent. But why would they be orthogonal if they're, if they're different modes? No. But that's, isn't that what this is? No, 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 because it's associated to different k's. Okay. 
it, it is it is associated to different case. The mm -hmm. orthognology will be going to the waves, and you can also assume it that here it also exists. If you don't feel comfortable okay. with that, if you don't feel comfortable, because it absolutely doesn't matter, the orthognology will appear in the exponential of IK, uh, IK dot R. Those orthognology oh, okay. will okay. dictate this. If you don't feel comfortable with this, just remove that. Is that fine? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No questions? Excellent. So now I have, I, I, we do have these uh, properties and we assign it here. All right. So this is for a given mode of a K. Now, Knowing these properties, uh, before going and driving electric, uh, we can do that also. We can drive electric field for each of them. But before doing so, let's let's look at uh, uh, look, uh, look at look at the case when we replace this inside of uh, 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 inside of wave equation now let us replace it inside of inside wave equation okay and now i take away the time uh, time the uh, uh, the time dependency I will assume that A of K for me now is given by A, A K. Then I have E of K and Sigma. Okay. And then I have E power of I K dot R. I will take away the time dependency and I will place it inside of this equation. Maybe let's do something more broader because I need to get an equation which is much more nicer. Let's do that way. Okay, a k is which is function of x and time is equal to summation or sigmas because sigma can take two values of one and two. Then I have a k, then I have a, a k and sigma, then I have e of k and sigma, then I have exponential of i k dot r. Look at this term. I added the time dependency inside of this as an independent parameter. And I'm doing the summation or uh, one and two, okay? So all field or all vector potential or let's say general vector potential or general solution will be summing up or all k vectors and of course also on polarization which will be a k a t k and sigma e k and sigma e power of i k dot r All right. This is a general solution that I have. 
So taking the derivative of A, uh, is there any question, by the way? If, if you want me, I can discuss uh, the terms. I think th this is the uh, position dependency, which we discussed already. And uh, we got the boundary condition from it. And we got the condition uh, for this from boundary condition. So which was k equal to 2 pi divided by L power of 2 of n1 power of 2 plus n2 power of 2 plus n3 power of 2. Uh, this is the polarization that we just discussed. So it is e k and sigma dot e k and sigma prime that will be delta sigma sigma prime. This term is the magnitude and later on by similarity with something else we drive this we will find these four modes okay and finally that term is the time dependency of the field or mode, okay? Okay, guys, uh, first of all, is this a real function? No. No. Electric field will, is only simply time derivative of this, right? Also, electric field is not real function. How can we make it real? Just adding a complex conjugate of it to itself, right? So we have exponential of i theta. We can look at the real part of this. The real part of this can be given by uh, uh, just summing up the e power of i theta plus e power of minus i theta. This is what we do. So here, uh, and of course we do have a freedom about the a k, which also I can apply. The general solution, now that we are not worried about being real or imaginary, is given by summation of k and sigma is one and two. I'm, I'm solving it in a Cartesian coordinate again, is a k, a t of k and sigma, e k of and sigma, e power of i k dot r plus conjugate, complex conjugate. All right. Let's write it down, the complex conjugate. So it, since uh, the vector E, I define it in the Cartesian coordinate, they will not get a uh, star. In the cylindrical, in, in a um, sequel polarization basis, that will be a different scenario. Okay. All right. No questions, I assume. 
Now, replacing no. the, okay, good. Replacing inside of wave equation, which was Laplacian minus one divided by C squared time derivative of A equal to zero. Then for all modes, what I will get, I will get summation on K and Sigma equal to one and two then uh, a is not time dependent is not coordinate dependent then i will get a k for the first one i will get uh, minus k squared i will do the calculation uh, now um, mm -hmm. yes okay A k and sigma, e power of i k dot r minus k square minus one divided by c d two d t square of a k and sigma t, okay. Any other things? No, the a is there, okay. Plus the conjugate quantities, con complex conjugate. And since this is this should be zero for any uh, values that we have, and sorry, there's an a here also. Since that should be zero for any k value and any sigma, then that term should be equal to zero. So, and then I will get a d2 square of a of k and sigma of t equal to uh, minus sign of minus sign of uh, c square. k square of a k and sigma t, which essentially is minus omega square of a k and sigma t. Okay. So now I got the the the, the, the uh, relation for the time dependency on the field. Okay. So here we know very well the solutions. They will be a k and sigma of t will be given by a k and zero of zero e power of minus i omega t, which I call these a1. Uh, essentially it's getting down, okay. And a of k and sigma t will have a second solution which is a of two and k and sigma of zero e power of i omega t. So I got two solutions. One of them is positive omega t and the other one is negative omega t. So can someone tell me what does it mean? And the time dependency is proportional to energy, right? Do you remember the Dirac equation that we discussed? We have either some like photon traveling in the negative time or it has the negative energy. It's traveling backward and this is antiparticle for photon. 
So antiparticle of photon is itself, which is traveling back in time. Okay, I think that was a question from uh, one of you guys. I think uh, that you asked this question. All right, so now uh, we know very well that, uh, uh, that we do have two different frequencies of omega and minus omega. And also we have two terms of this and this, which is e power of ik dot r and minus ik dot r. All right. So we can replace all there here. And what we will get, we will get this expression. I, I don't want to write the entire of those equations again. I just want to write down uh, what's going on with the terms which they're associated to the time, okay? And uh, by the way, there is a little bit of trick that you have to really go from, because the entire of the calculation that they have done is for the positive K, Z, positive KY and positive KZ. So you have to expand it to entire the space, which is not really, really difficult. It's just a little bit of playing with, uh, with the modes, making it symmetric, covering the entire of the space and dividing it by eight, okay? So it's a little bit of trick to do these mathematics, but it's not significant, significantly difficult. It's just a little bit of calculation. And if you replace it inside of these, you, what you will get, you will get these terms. So you will get a k and sigma. And of course, there is a summation on the top of this, zero, e power of minus i omega t, e power of i k dot r plus a k zero, e power of minus i omega t and then you have e power of i k dot r then you have a2 of k and sigma 0 e power of i omega t e power of i k dot r plus a two of k and sigma zero e power of i omega t e power of k dot r okay so this term And this term, if you sum them up together, they will give you a real quantity, but they are describing a back propagating photon. While if you look at these two terms, they will give you forward propagating photon with a positive energy. Okay, so uh, so far we understand that. Uh, by the way, we have to. We are right now working with the vector potential. We have to come back to electric field and magnetic field, and that's that's a bit of a discussion. And remember also something important else uh, that hap happens here. This is a picture that a later on when we define the a operator. Okay, annihilation and creation operator. This is Heisenberg picture. Which the operator, they are time dependent. And here, if you watch this, This is Schrodinger picture, which the op operator of annihilation and creation operator, which we discussed, they are time independent. 
So these are the two difference between the two equations that we have written. That's the reason that I replace it inside the wave equation because I want to describe that for you. A any questions so far or you're okay? Good. Excellent. So, uh, so then, then what I can write, I mean, as I say to you, uh, simply, uh, I think we do have five minutes. I will just uh, arrive to a point which we can start uh, our course properly. K okay, and sigma, which is one and two. And then I say that this is a uh, AK. This is E of K and Sigma. Then we have uh, A of T, E power of I K dot R. Plus a of k star e of k and sigma a star of t e power of minus i k dot r okay so that's an uh, that's the vector potential remember that also k is quantized and is given by the expression that i i mentioned that to you or this is a Heisenberg picture, or you can write it in Schrodinger's picture, which is K and Sigma equal to one and two. And that is A K E K Sigma A zero. Oh, by the way, A, ha A has to be labeled by K and Sigma, K and Sigma. That can be labeled by a k and z sigma of zero, e power of i a k dot r minus omega t plus a star of k e k and sigma a k sigma of zero e power of i. The conjugate is minus k dot r minus omega t. Okay. These, as I say, these for Schrodinger's picture, that's for uh, Heisenberg picture. Uh, I think we can we can stop here. Uh, for the next lecture, uh, uh, I, I drive, uh, I jump from, uh, f uh, let's say, we have, uh, okay, as an exercise, by the way, for yourself. You, uh, from this equation, please find electric field and magnetic field. Which electric field is given by time derivative of A and B is given by curl of A. Is, uh, it is not difficult, it's extremely easy. Do this and from electric field and magnetic field that we do have, and we did the proper quantization, then we will go to uh, finding the energy for the modes uh, 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 inside of this cavity, and then we will make it similar to harmonic oscillators, and we will do proper quantization of the field. And after that, we'll talk about annihilation creation operator. And next lecture, I may discuss about Casimir effect. Okay, so I, I will let you study what is inside of the book, and I'm covering the rest for you. So I will cover the Casimir effect and uh, you will be reading about a uh, lamp shift and, uh, and uh, quantum bits. Uh, and after that, we will go with the proper uh, uh, formalism and notations. So you will see it during next lecture. Uh, I think we are done for today. I will stop here.